Hello and welcome to If You Love This Planet. My guest today is Tom Cochran, the Wade Green Chair for Nuclear Policy and, and is a nuclear physicist and senior scientist in the Natural Resources Defence Council's Nuclear Program, NRDC. He is the author and co-author of several books and numerous articles on nuclear weapons, proliferation and nuclear energy. Tom Cochran received his doctorate from Vanderbilt University in 1967 and has been with the Natural Resources Defence Council since 73. Tom Cochran is currently a member of the Department of Energy's Nuclear Energy Research Advisory Committee and has served on a number of government and non-government advisory committees. In 1987, he received both the American Physical Society Zillard Award and the Federation of American Scientists Public Service Award. Tom Cochran, welcome to If You Love Us Planet. Thank you. It's good to have you on, Tom. Uh, I've got lots and lots <laughs> of questions. Now, you recently testified before a committee um, of the, was it the Senate or the House? The Senate. The Senate giving a very detailed um, analysis of what's been happening at Fukushima. It was on April the 14th. We're now, I think, uh, on May the 1st, or that was yesterday, May Day. So it's two weeks since you testified. What I'd like you to do, Tom, if you would please, is to update us about the situation in Fukushima. I want to know the state of each reactor, one, two, three, and four, of the cooling pools one, two, three, and four, and the common generic cooling pool, and also reactors five and six, which are about one, one and a half k from the main complex. W would you mind doing that, Tom, so that we can all understand at this point of time where things are? Well, unfortunately, uh, we really don't know how things are. We believe they are. Uh, more or less stable, but uh, that could change if there were another uh, incident, such as an earthquake. Uh, but it appears, uh, and we cross our fingers, that uh, the situation is uh, gradually improving. At uh, reactors 1, 2, and 3, um, the, of course, the reactors were damaged. They had fuel in them at the time of the earthquake. The reactors shut down as planned, but uh, due to the tsunami, it, uh, they lost off-site power, and uh, the loss of off-site power outlasted the uh, availability of on-site power from diesel from the uh, batteries. They also lost on-site power from backup diesel generators because these were located uh, below ground and they were flooded by the tsunami. So we don't really know precisely what the status of the fuel is in those three reactors whether any of them, uh, we know fuel melted in uh, the reactors, but we don't know whether it subsequently melted through the reactor vessel into the primary containment. And Tom, why, why is off-site power so important? What does that do? And why is loss of it so major? Well, the, uh, when you... Uh, uh, when the reactor is operating, uh, you, it's uh, fissioning the uranium-235 isotopes, and you get a whole litany of radioactive fission products, some of them very short-lived, and some of them have much longer half-lives. When you shut the reactor down and stop the chain reaction, you don't stop the radioactive decay of the fission products. And that decay process releases heat. Uh, it releases K2 
gamma rays, X rays, and alpha particles, and so forth, and and those are absorbed in the materials locally and and converted into thermal energy. And so that therm heat production is sufficient to melt the fuel if you do not keep it covered with water. So you must keep it not only covered, but you must keep the water circulating to prevent it from boiling away and and uncovering. Once it's uncovered, the zirconium or zircaloy cladding of the fuel interacts with the steam from the overheated boiling water and produces hydrogen. And that occurred at these reactors, and some of that hydrogen was vented into the reactor building and uh, was at sufficient concentration that it exploded and blew the tops off of two of the buildings. And we don't know the extent of the damage the hydrogen explosions did to uh, various internal components because the radioactivity spread around <clears throat> by the uh, uh, leaking of the fission products makes the reactors too hot to enter and survey with human beings. They've attempted to send robots in, but the robots are not able to get into the reactor vessel, of course. So it will be some months to years before we really know the wow. extent of the damage. And the fuel still needs to be continu continually cooled, so it's necessary to continue to pump water into the reactor uh, vessel to keep the fuel cool. And in one or more of those reactors, the water is leaking out and going in various places, and some of it eventually uh, ending up in the sea. At, at the unit number four, at the time of the accident, that unit was shut down for refueling, but the fuel had been removed from the reactor and put in the spent fuel pool, and that... Uh, for reasons we don't completely understand, the, there was loss of water from that pool, and and uh, the fuel was uncovered, and and the radioactive fission products uh, overheated the fuel. The cladding interacted again with the steam uh, and and produced hydrogen, and so. That that reactor is has essentially been destroyed, but because of the uh, failure of the spent fuel storage pool, the two remaining reactors, units five and six, were shut down at the time of the accident, and they were not being refueled, and there was. They apparently have survived intact. Right. So now how, therefore, we know that each reactor needs, it said, a million gallons a minute of circulating water to keep them cool. The external electricity supply fed the pumps that supplied the cooling water. The, the external electricity went out because of the earthquake, as it did in various parts of the area. Uh, the diesel generators failed because they were virtually flooded by the tsunami. The emergency uh, batteries only lasted eight hours. How do we know, though, Tom Cochran, um, that there have been meltdowns in one, two, three units, and if so, how much of the fuel's melted? So, number one, how do we know there have been meltdowns? And number two, how can we assess how much has melted and what the damage could be? Well, I think that's, uh, uh, at this stage, that's 
speculation, and there are uh, uh, many people in the nuclear industry are trying to uh, sharpen their pencils and figure out how much is likely to have melted. But I don't think anyone really knows at this, at, at this point. We do know that there was fuel melting because of the uh, types of radioactive fission products that were released from the reactor and particles that were released both on-site and off-site. And what were they specifically? Well, we, we there was uh, the two principal ones were the um, Iden-131, mm -hmm. which has an eight-day half-life. And uh, so you had a, a lot of Iden released from the site. And so you wouldn't expect that unless it either came from damaged uh, fuel in the reactors or damaged fuel in the unit four yep, spent yep. fuel pool. Yep. And then there was uh, uh, cesium-137. Mm -hmm. uh, there were other isotopes as well, but these were the major contributors to the hazard off-site. Cesium-134? 134, 134 yep. and 137. Yep. And so... Uh, the 134 has a short half-life, yeah, yeah. so it suggests that, uh, that uh, there was damage to f fuel that had been uh, in, in, in the reactor a short time previously. Now, how do, how do they assess how much melt there has been or what percentage of the core has melted in each reactor, and I think people should know there's about 100 tons of radioactive fuel in each reactor. Is that correct, Tom Cochran? Uh, appro that's approximately correct. Yeah. I don't, but I, I don't think one knows the actual percentages of the fuel that m melted. I mean, one, uh, you know, they they have some data on how much of they think the core was uncovered, but uh, and they would probably stipulate uh, uh, assume that that part of the uncovered fuel, uncovered by water, uh, that that portion of the fuel was melted. But I, I don't think they really know. Well, there was an announcement that came from either TEPCO or. Japanese government that number one had experienced a 70% meltdown, that number two had in fact melted down through the bottom of the containment and hit the concrete floor. W would you concur with those um, estimates, Tom? You know, I, I would take that as uh, estimates by engineers that have more data than I do, uh -huh. uh, but I, I would not... Uh, have high confidence in those precise right. numbers until they get in and actually examine the fuel. And as you recall from the Three Mile Island accident, getting in and examining the fuel came uh, uh, months to, to years later. And yep. in this case, the, the uh, area that you would have to access to get to the fuel is too hot to send humans in. Mm. So at, at Three Mile Island, you 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 never breach the reactor vessel uh, per se. Uh, they did vent noble gases, but the area above the reactor was accessible after to the accident, and you could take the top off. You know, flood, reflood the reactor, take the top off, and get in and, and pull the fuel out. In this in this case, that's going to be a very, very difficult uh, operation because of the high radiation yeah. doses in the area. And they took a long time, actually, to find the, the actual damage and find the larval melt of the core at Chernobyl, right? Well, not at Chernobyl, at Three Mile Island. No, I'm talking about Chernobyl now. Well, Chernobyl, I've... <laughs> was pretty well totaled. I mean, I, 
I don't know the precise numbers, but I, that was in a roaring fire for days. Oh, and, yes, I know. And that, that yeah. was uh, completely destroyed. And, yeah. and, and unlike Fukushima, it, uh, you know, there was no real containment. And uh, yeah. the hot fire through the uh, fission products and, and uranium mm. high into the air and spread it around. Asia and Europe and the rest of the world. For that yeah. Matter. Now I've read that Unit Two, um, there's a hole in it. Um, that there's a, a nuclear engineer called Andy Gunderson who said it's like having a sneeze but holding your nose. And so there was a, an explosion in Unit Two, but it didn't blow up, but formed a hole in the side from whence the water is escaping. Meaning when they keep pouring water in the top, out it goes through the hole. Is is that your understanding, Tom Cochran? Uh. That's not my understanding, but again, I don't, I, I don't profess to be an expert on the precise details uh. of what the situation is now. I would say that's not where the water is leaking out. I think the water, again, I don't think they know how, where the yeah. water is going completely. They know it's going into the all of these reactors are connected. They're all connected to the turbine building, and they're getting water leaking into the turbine building. But uh, I'm not sure they know precisely yeah. the leak paths out of the reactor vessels uh, so it's sort of to all, get to the turbine building. It's, it's sort of all guesstimates in a certain sense, Tom Cochran. Uh, that's, my, yeah. that's my belief, and that's... I don't think those details, we're not going to learn a, a whole lot more soon, I don't think, about those details. And those details are so sketchy. Mm. You know, the U.S. Nuclear Regulatory Commission has a rotating group of staff in Tokyo that are trying to figure out what's going on, and they are... They prepare daily briefings to the U U.S. Nuclear Regulatory Commissioners, and we're not seeing those daily briefs. And they why? Well, I I, I think it's uh, unfortunately they don't, but they they have this mindset that if the information is speculative, and which it it is, just as we are discussing yeah. these issues, that uh, they don't want to release it to the public because, you know, two days later they may have a different view. In, in my view, they ought to release it because that's the situation we're in. We don't know precisely what's happening, and, and if, if that information is good enough for the commissioners, it ought to be good enough for the public. Exactly, and it reminds me of Governor Thornburg when Three Mile Island was happening, his famous quote, he said, we're like a couple of blind men staggering around in the dark. And, uh, you know, we, we, the public, have every right to know what the NRC is estimating. And also what also bugs me, Tom Cochran, is that the Complete Test Ban Treaty Organization has a series of, I think, 68 monitors around the Northern Hemisphere monitoring very precisely any increase in radioactive fallout so that they know if some nation is testing weapons or not, and they are not releasing that data either. Is that accurate? I, I believe this. they're releasing it to the uh, parties, and some of the parties, some of that data is getting out, yeah. but it's not getting out routinely, I don't believe. This is I mean, really I, all of this states ought to just be, in a situation like this, it's, it's really inexcusable that the states don't say, gee, this is a great set of data, let's get this out to the public as, as, as quickly as we can. And today, you know, today we can go on the web and look at a, a webcam 
and see what the weather looks like at the beach. Mm. But you can't go on the web and look at the radiation monitor at the nuclear site. So I think we need to bring you those... You mean at, at normal American nuclear reactor sites? Yes. I mean, it has multiple radiation monitors. I think it, 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 with today's technology, all of that ought to be put on the yeah. web so yeah. that people who live in the area can just sit at their computer and read the monitors themselves. And know yeah. when there's been a burp or... Uh, or know when there's nothing happening. Yeah, that's you know? right. They need to and, know. Yep. And then you have... You you raise that... I've raised that issue in some, in some cases. They say, well, but EPA may have a problem with that because of the, some of these systems are not turned on or the data isn't reading correctly. Well, well if, if it isn't, maybe the public ought to ought to know about that, you know, maybe. As we'd say in Australia, they bloody well should know. <laughs> maybe the EPA would fix it a little quicker, um, a little more quickly if uh, people called them up and said, by the way, your monitor isn't working. Well, everyone in uh, listening to this, I'm saying, should uh, ring the EPA. What is the relationship, Tom Cochran, between the EPA and the Complete Test Ban Treaty series of monitors around America? Do they interdigitate? Are they connected? Do they communicate? Are they uh, I, the I don't know thing? the answer to that. I don't know whether the... My guess is they're different systems, but... Ah, I, I, you don't know. I don't know that for a fact. And are there monitors in every state? Uh, EPA monitors? Yeah. Um... I don't know the distribution yeah. of the EPA monitors. And I can't tell you how many hundreds of Facebook questions I'm getting from people who are, I've got two children, I've got a baby, I hear there's iodine in the milk, or I can, and Marie seems fallen in, in uh, New England, what does that mean? I mean, but without access to the data that the government clearly has and is sitting on, what can you tell people? I mean, it's it's just a really hideous situation as far as I'm concerned as a physician uh, trying to help people who are really desperate. I, I don't have concern about the radiation exposures from Fukushima uh -huh. to people in the United States. Uh -huh. I, I think there's a serious problem ongoing as we speak in uh, Fukushima prefecture uh, because the Japanese government just increased, uh, I think last Friday or so, mm -hmm. the um, allowable dose to children at, at schoolyards and, and playgrounds to uh, 20 millisieverts per year. Well, translate that, Tom, to millirems. That's uh, two rems per year, yep. and it is actually the dose for occupation, the dose limit under normal circumstances for occupational workers in in the nuclear business. Yeah, not for not for kids, which are much more who are much more vulnerable. Now, if you go to the uh, U.S. Uh, National Academy's beer committee. Uh, beer stands for biological effects of ionizing radiation, low-level ionizing number radiation. Number seven. And number seven is their latest report of, yeah. in 2006. You will see that if you uh, were to, but their best estimate is if you were to expose a population of children, of, of boys and girls, age 10, to two rims of radiation, that's one year's worth under this allowable limit, you would expect one cancer per 250 children, of, of which one fatality for every 550 children. So if 
give. It's be I'd be higher than that, Tom. I yeah. As a well, that, I'm talking yeah. about ten ten year old children. Yes, if they yes. were younger, yes, the risk would be higher. Yes. It now, but if they were exposed for two years, mm -hmm. you know that's like a one percent. One percent of the kids on the playground would be expected to get a cancer sometime later in their life. That's that's a ridiculously high and unnecessary risk to impose on on those children. In in the United States from Fukushima, the the radioactive iodine and other particulates gets uh, dispersed considerably before it rains out in selected areas in, in, in the U.S. So the, the dosages are much, much less, and they're at a point that I don't think... Uh, it's a, always a personal judgment, but in in my own personal judgment, I I would not think it warranted uh, any protective action uh, because the the risk would be uh, very very small. There would be risk. There would, there would be some risk, but it would be very very small. Unlike the case in, in, in Japan. I'm interviewing Tom Cochran, who's a senior scientist and a brilliant phys physicist, if I may say so, at the, uh, at the Natural Resources Defence Council. Tom, on another question, Arnie Gunderson, once again, who's the nuclear engineer, said that there was, at fuel pool number four, a big explosion, but just as it was occurring, there was a blinding white flash and he postulates that there was an excursion, or in other words, a, a kind of nuclear explosion at that time. Would you agree with that, Tom, or not? I, I would not think so. You would I not. Mean, think so. I think there may have been a hydrogen explosion. Could that uh, produce a white, a blinding white flash? And you've probably seen the video. You, uh, it could, it, it could have. I mean, it would have. Uh, it could have, uh, but I don't think there's any real uh, risk or, or serious view that that fuel sort of Reach got in a mass. recriticality situation. You don't think? Well, what about the fact that plutonium is being found, well, it has been found, they report in Hawaii, and americium in uh, New England, etc. They're heavy metals, and, you'd, and, and the assumption would be that they, in fact, had been aerosolized and become lighter in particulate form and, and traveled via the wind currents to be dumped down in America when it rained and the like. And, and that could only occur with a really, <laughs> with maybe a, 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 a such an explosion, or, or could that happen just with a hydrogen explosion in a fuel pool? First of all, I don't. I, I have not seen that evidence with regard to americium and plutonium measurements in the U.S. Yeah, plutonium in Hawaii. Where, yeah. I am aware of, you know, uh, plutonium measurements uh, in the area of the reactor. Yes. So it, it's very clear that fuel that uh, there there was events that caused the fuel to be dispersed in particular form mm -hmm. uh, around the site. And, and, of course, if it's around the site, it, some of it would have uh, moved off the site. So what event could that be, a hydrogen explosion? Would, would that do it, in par uh, putting spreading plutonium in particulate form? Uh, uh, it in my view, it could. Yeah. Yes, you could have it. The cladding could have melted mm. first, and then you had uh, uh, an explosion, which would have spread the uh, particles of fuel or dispersed them yeah. around and outside. 
Now, the, the other thing that I want to know is um, they're, they're running around with Geiger counters in Japan measuring radiation. Well, we know that they, they're measuring gamma, but quite a few of the isotopes, and let's face it, that 200 isotopes are made of, in a reactor, some which have extremely short half-lives, but there are many with longer half-lives that we don't talk about, tellurium and technetium and all sorts of things, cerium and things, um, that, that are, you know, are, are almost certainly probably being released too. And some, many of them give out gamma, but some A do not. Some only give out alpha. Uh, some give out beta and gamma, but they can't be with their gam with their Geiger counters picking up these specific isotopes in the air, in the food, etc. Would you concur with that, Tom Cochran? Well, if if it's a typical handheld uh, survey meter, right. loosely termed a Geiger counter, yeah. Uh, that would be correct. There, there would also be air monitors in the area where, in effect, you have a machine that uh, sucks air through a, a filter paper that's a, a essentially a strip of paper that moves along, and, and you're sucking air through it uh -huh. and collecting particulates on the paper. Uh -huh. And that paper is then passed under a counter, and depending on the sophistication of the counter, it could detect both the gamma emitters and beta emitters, and if you took that paper into the lab or if you took particles of dirt into the lab, you could also count alpha particles, and in fact, there are portable alpha meters, they're not as efficient as the gamma detectors, but uh, but from an event like this, or from even from Chernobyl, you sh one assumes you get the whole litany of fission products released. Now, typically one assumes that there are, I mean, one knows there are some of the fission products are gases. They're noble gases that don't interact with anything. And if they have a path out into the environment, they will escape completely. And so you, uh, for example, in a nuclear weapons test, the, one of the things you look for is uh, Krypton-85. Uh, at the Three Mile Island accident, after the accident was all over, the secondary containment contained Krypton-85 gas, and they, a, m a month or so after the accident, or several months after the accident, they vented that uh, just to get rid of it, uh, and that carried some, some risk. But then the next sort of group of isotopes are ones that are volatile, that are very volatile, and, and if the fuel heats up, those get out first and in greater concentration. So would you like, what, which ones are they? Those Carbon would be 14, tritium, cesium, one, cesium, the cesium, cesiums, 137, yep. 134, iodine, uh, 131, 129, and, and then you go further down, there are less volatile materials, You like strontium-90, and then down, the ones that are least volatile are some of these uh, things like plutonium and americium, and they're not going to get out in large quantity unless you have some sort of explosion yeah. to throw them out or some in the case of Chernobyl, some roaring fire that can lift them up with other particulates, just like the ashes from your fireplace. So, the, you know, when people don't have good uh, measurement data, they rely on their instincts of what is likely to have been instincts. emitted. 
Yeah. And so, and then you, as you know, uh, some of these isotopes are more hazardous to humans than others, either because of the type of radiation they are emitted or because of the way they uh, concentrate in organs in the body. And the so, food chain. And the food chain. So when we when you sort through all of these parameters, both the transport con, uh, differences and the hazardous differences in the body, you tend to focus on a few isotopes that you think are going to dominate the dose to the human. And, and that's going to change over time. So in the first few weeks, the exposure is dominated by the, typically, not always, but typically by the iodine, which, as you know, falls out. It can be inhaled as the cloud passes by you. And if it's not inhaled, it can some of it falls out onto the ground. Uh, some of it is rained. When, when it rains, it sort of washes it out, gets into the grass. The cows eat the grass. It concentrates in the milk, and then you, you, it's taken up by children and whoever else eats the dairy product. So that's, But that hazard will dissipate because of the eight day half-life of iodine, and in, in 10 half-lives, which would be about 80 days, the just from the radioactive decay, that exposure has been potentially reduced by a factor of 1,000, and in uh, another 80 days, or 160 days total, it's down by a million. So in, in, a, in a half a year, that yeah. problem is gone unless there's some chain reaction still bubbling away. Yeah, that particular problem. But then there are other isotopes that are rarely mentioned, Tom. Carbon-14, technetium-99. Technetium gets mentioned a lot in other circumstances because it, 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 it gets into the water yeah. and, and flows. You know, it, you had a lot of technetium that came... Um, Associated with the uranium enrichment, where they were re-enriching yeah. uh, uranium that had been recovered from produ plutonium production reactor mm. fuel, and that seeped into the water supplies around places like Paducah. But yeah, I'm carbon fourteen. That's a nasty one. I, I usually think of that in terms of at a fuel reprocessing facility. You you might get uh, large releases of carbon fourteen up through the stack, uh, but not in a meltdown situation. Not not like at Fukushima. It wouldn't. Well, get I would think you. I mean, I would. Th I would think carbon fourteen is released. My immediate belief, with without having any data to confirm or deny it, would be that. That would not, at this stage, be a controlling dose issue. Well, but that yeah. carbon-14 has a, a half-life of thousands of years, so it's going to be around to do its damage for thousands of years. So even if its concentration is much, much smaller, its individual risk may be much, much smaller than, say, the risk from the cesium-137, but over thousands of years, yeah. uh, those tiny little risks will, will add up. Multiply. Well, it, you know, it combines in the DNA molecule because the body's pretty well, much of it's made of carbon. But what about tritium, too? That's never mentioned. That's ubiquitous, and that's a damn nasty isotope. Well, you say it's damn nasty. I think. Well, according to the literature in the <laughs> Journal of Health Physics, Tom, they've done a lot of work on tritium, and it's not a nice thing. This is my personal opinion. Tritium, as radioactive isotopes go, it emits a beta particle, yeah. but a very low energy. Soft beta. beta. Yep. So, so it 
compared to cesium, I would much rather be close to a curie of tritium than a curie really? of cesium. Oh. <laughs> but because the hazard is less. Now, but I don't know how to, how do you define hazard? Let Tom? me fit. Yeah, let me I'll fit. let you finish. Sorry. On the other hand, tritium is hydrogen, is, is uh, uh, isotope of hydrogen. Mm. And so it gets in the, I mean, we have, the, our bodies are full of hydrogen mm -hmm. because it's water and, uh, and tissue. And so it, it's, uh, it can get into the DNA, whereas the cesium wouldn't get into the DNA. So it carries a, a higher risk in that respect. But when, when I sort of, in my own view, which may be incorrect, but factor in all of these uh, issues, I would not place tritium high on, on uh, my list of concerns of isotopes coming out of Fukushima. You can just go to a, um, like the EPA publishes a, a, a report that lists the hazards of all of the radioisotopes, uh, depending on whether you're inhaling them or ingesting them and so forth. And when you compare tritium with other isotopes such as cesium, you, it's, it's not as... Uh, not nearly as hazardous. So. Well, I, I, Tom, I, I, I don't like to disagree with you, but on this I would because there's a vast body of literature on tritium done by nuclear health physicists, um, which was published in, in the early 70s in the Journal of Health Physics and then at more in the early 80s, I think that's, uh, well, if you look at my book, Nuclear Power is Not the Answer, I've, I've got many references to this literature, and it's nasty stuff because tritium actually, nothing invades and gets through the skin, which is a very important integument, but tritium does, and it combines with the DNA molecule. It's a soft beta. Therefore, most of the energy is captured within the tissue. It doesn't escape, and it's very, very mutagenic as such, and so... I think that the nuclear industry tends to down let play tritium and say, oh, it's only radioactive hydrogen. But if you look at the literature, they in fact show deep concern and they've done numerous animal experiments, which of course you extrapolate to humans. And so I would, I would disagree with you on that. But uh, I want, and, and thank you for giving us your um, interpretation. But I want to move on to something that really concerns me. It seems from all you've said, Tom, and incidentally, Tom is a senior scientist and physicist from the uh, Natural Resources D Defense Council, that any estimates of the total amount of radiation getting up from Fukushima or landing in areas around Fukushima or evacuation zones based on this data or or radiation in Tokyo or spreading around the northern hemisphere as the winds blow west to east is a kind of guesstimate game because the measurements really on the whole are not very specific. Would 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 you agree with that, Tom Cochran, or not? Um it it depends on the question you ask. Yeah. Now, if if you ask me, um, well, how much how much radiation risk? I, I mean, if you ask, place the radiation risk from the Fukushima accident. Uh, how does that? relate to the radiation risk from Three Mile Island and from Chernobyl. Now, I can't say within a factor of 10 uh, what those risks are in any of those cases. Uh -huh. But I do feel comfortable saying that Fukushima is in, in a logarithmic scale, in terms of factors of 10, 
it's about midway between Three Mile Island and Chernobyl, meaning it's maybe a hundred times worse than Three Mile Island and a hundred times less than Chernobyl, and I could be off by a factor of 10 on any, either of those numbers. So, but if you said, uh, okay, I live, uh, or I have a friend who lives in some particular area of, of Fukushima Prefecture or one of the other counties around there, uh, how well do you, do I believe the Japanese government knows what their exposure is, has been, and will be? I would say the uncertainties are, mu are much larger. Mm. Uh, mm. at any individual location because the as you know the the monitoring is limited in terms of the number of monitors and their location mm -hmm. wind can blow between the monitors and not you know so the higher exposures can be not picked up mm -hmm. uh so there are lots of, and, and and then you get, you know, you're getting reports of what are really uh, external gamma mm. readings, mm. and and you say, well, first of all, as you pointed out earlier, they're not picking up the betas, they're not picking up the alphas. Uh, they're not measuring what was inhaled. They're not measuring um, what's going through the food chain. So um, that's not to say that there are other measurements could be doing that, but they, they're just a, a, a lot of holes. So you don't know what individual exposures really are. You know, if you're... If a person is inside the house most of the day, and, and these are readings that are taken outside of the house, the person inside the house may get, be getting an exposure of a fifth or a tenth of what the readings would suggest. So, uh, Or children outside the house. and Children, children outside are right. going to have a, a risk that's a lot higher than their parents. And and as one vet said to me when I went to Harrisburg a week after Three Mile Island happened, he said, watch the animals and the children. Their noses are closer to the ground. <laughs> and they'll get the impacts first. Children will get uh, they plan the higher dirt. dose from ground shine. Yeah, and they plan the dirt. What, what's ground shine, Tom? Let people know. Radioactive particulates are, are lying on the ground yeah. and they're emitting gamma rays. You, you know, you're getting exposed to what's on the ground around you uh, as opposed to exposure from inhaling the cloud as it sweeps by. Or inhaling particulates from the soil into their bodies. Yeah, so if, if you, and again, this is just a crude uh, estimate, but if if you were living uh, downwind of Chernobyl and and you had, let's suppose you had a good measure of the, or you had a model that estimated the amount of radioactive in, activity in the cloud as it came by you, and you'd, you'd in your model you'd calculate what your uh, dose would be from inhaling the cesium-137. Well, it turns out that that would only be half of your lifetime exposure because there would be an equal or a, a comparable exposure from the cesium that fell on the ground. Mm -hmm. And if you lived in that area and ate local vegetables, you would get the exposure from the mushrooms you ate and uh, spinach and so forth. So 
like they're a radioactive ball rushing around Germany and getting into Berlin now that are terribly radioactive and people who like to hunt boar, they're having to put them in to be tested or like uh, because the boar eat the truffles and the mushrooms which very much concentrate cesium and other isotopes and that's you know there are over 300 farms in Wales and Cumbria whose lambs are so full of cesium 137 they can't be sold on the market and the government said they must shut their farms down for 100 years but a cesium lasts much longer than that it's actually a longer lifetime but uh well, cesium has a 30-year head. Yeah, so, so it's around for a fair time. What are, uh, We've only got a few minutes left, Tom Cochran, and I'm sorry about that, but can you give us, pre, please, in that four minutes, your brief prognostication of how you think the accident is going to proceed in Japan, please? As we go forward, I, I think uh, it's going to... Uh, Percolate, you know, it, it's like uh, a coffee percolator. <laughs> it's like cooking, uh, putting putting your your uh, stew on low heat, and just it's just kind of bubbling away. And the problem is that you have to continue to cool this fuel, and you will have to do that for year, not many years, but Five. at least for. Um, a, uh, on the order of a year uh, b bef before it reaches the point where if it were uncovered it wouldn't melt again. So you have to keep this covered. So they're pumping water in there and the water is going somewhere. It's leaking out of the system. It doesn't just go in mm. and Stay in an, in a nice steel drum. It it's leaking out of a holy steel drum. And they've already pumped about uh, I think the last number I saw, which was several days ago, about sixty seven thousand tons of water through these systems. Uh, so that pumping of the water and it and it's flowing over this. Uh, uncovered fuel mm -hmm. and and washing it out and and it's just going to continue to sort of leak in that manner I, I, some of it is going to turn to steam and so you're going to get um, atmospheric releases in the, in addition to the liquid pathway releases so it's it's going to perk along what about if there's another earthquake or major aftershock in that area well, I think that I think they they worry about that. And uh, do I'm, you? Well, I, I'm not a seismologist, but my sort of lay opinion is it could happen, but it's not the most likely thing that'll happen. But it could, you know, it could happen. I mean, it, you could get another uh, magnitude nine earthquake. In the area, I mean, you could have a devastating, enough. which would damage the already damaged vessels that have been damaged by all this water and the rest. Right, and it could damage the ones that are uh, the, the uh, spent fuel pools, mm. and uh, and it could damage operating reactors too. I mean, it's <laughs> but it's. I think. My sense is that the worst is over, but it's going to perk along. And mm. what, what about Rikosho, Rikosho, um the reprocessing plant not far up the coast, just near um, earthquake zones? That's a very dangerous plant. Well, they it? had, you know, they had a blackout at Rikosho yeah. at the same yeah. time, and and they fortunately they didn't. Uh, you know, they got the power back on yeah, and they remediated the water. But, the, you know, while this thing is per perking along, the shorter-lived fission products are decaying away and the hazard is going down and the longer-lived fission products are going to start becoming more important contributors to a smaller exposure. So... 
So when people will will start focusing on the cesium-137, because for in my in my view for a number of years, as as, as it was the case in Chernobyl, that's going to sort of start dominating the mm. exposure pathway, mm. and uh, and then after decades, you'll start worrying more about other isotopes. Yes, and as we know, it takes a long t The isotopes hang around for years, get into the food chain for years, they're tasteless, odorless, invisible, and cancer takes years to develop too once people have been exposed. So it's an ongoing saga. Uh, as someone said recently, a nuclear accident never ends. Well, uh, as did the nuclear atmospheric testing. Yeah. Except you guys in the southern hemisphere, we don't got, get it. Got, you, well, you got a little from the from the Brits. From the Brits and the French, and, the French. and we don't like not <laughs> one little bit. But but you didn't get the the big dose from the Americans and the oh, and the Russians and the Chinese. Yes. Well, they're, they're small potatoes compared to the Russians and the Americans. Now, Tom, I I, I want to thank you very much for this really fantastic interview. People are aching, dying to know the sort of information you've been given from a highly qualified physicist, and I thank you very much for your work, Tom Cochran. You're quite welcome. My guest today on If You Love This Planet was Tom Cochran, the Wade Green Chair for Nuclear Policy and a nuclear physicist and senior scientist in the Natural Resources Defence Council's nuclear program.